Uh, this screencast is going to be about complex reactions. Um, so we've done a little bit in the lectures about how you would actually go about doing it. Uh, just this is sort of a recap and some extra detail about it. Uh, so if you're struggling to understand why uh, we're doing this, this is going to be quite useful for you, hopefully. Um, and if you think it's quite easy to do, um, stick around to the end when we do this whole modeling thing. It's uh, quite uh an interesting approach to it that I think you might get some use out of. Um, so what we're going to actually cover, we're going to start with reaction complexity. Uh, what is a complex reaction in our case? What are we talking about? Uh, and then we're going to build up complexity in a few steps. So what I'm going to do is build up the ideas behind the complex reaction bit by bit. The simplest version, equilibria. Uh, and then to two step reactions, then more than two st steps, uh, and then modeling. So we're going to model a far more complex reaction. And that's kind of close to how you would probably do it in research. Uh, there's two quick definitions I want to cover first. Uh, one, uh, this concept of an analytical solution. So an analytical solution is something that is exact. Um, we start by manipulating our maths and our symbols together, and then we have just a simple equation that predicts something. Uh, of course, it only works for a limited number of variables. So um, a good example of an analytical solution uh, is a first order integrated rate law. So you've come across this equation before. Uh, this predicts the concentration of A at time t based only on the starting concentration, the rate constant, and at time. Uh, now these, the rate constant and the starting concentration, are effectively constant. Uh, they are data points that we can find out quite easily. The only variable is time. We just need to take this equation and plug time into it, and we can figure out the concentration of A at any time, like 10 seconds from now, 10 minutes from now, 10 hours from now, 10 days from now, it doesn't matter, this will go on forever. Uh, in fact, we don't even really need to know the concentration that it starts with, we could set that to 100%. And uh, Next we have the numerical solution. Uh, in this case, we actually do approximation, so we wouldn't be building an equation like this, we would be figuring out what is the concentration a second from now, then two seconds from now, then a second after that. We do it step by step, calculating actual numbers out. Um, now that has actually an advantage that it works pretty much for everything. Uh, we can do numerical solutions for any equation we like, no matter how complicated. Uh, if you want an analytical solution, you usually need to um, have only simplified things. So in this case, you know, we've only got time as a variable, we've only got um, con one concentration and so on. So analytical solutions are really nice, but they are limited in use. Uh, so the entire point of this whole complex reaction section is to produce analytical solutions for our rate of reaction or our concentrations. This is what we're aiming for. We've got complicated reactions and we're going to manipulate the symbols that we use to represent them, all the maths, and throw them together to figure something out. What is the rate of reaction? Can we predict it using just time? Uh, and when we get on to modelling at the end, that will be the numerical solution. So you don't really need to know any of that, but it's useful anyway. Uh, so reaction complexity. Uh, so, you know, we can start with a simple reaction, we can make it really complicated, we can make it really, really super complicated, and we can tear our hair out um, thinking about how complicated is this, we can't really do anything with it. Um, but the idea, again, with this topic is to try and simplify it down to much more simple um, solutions. Uh, so, here's an example of a reaction, uh, reaction that could be complex. I gave you some data associated with this in a workshop. It's a simple elimination. We are eliminating a phenyl ligand and a hydride ligand to form benzene. Those are just coming off and reforming benzene. Uh, so that would be simple first order kinetics. Right? If we have time, we have a concentration, it will decay exponentially. That is a terrible exponential curve. I will draw it again. Uh, and if we took a log of that concentration, plotted against time, you would get a straight line, and then 
r gradient is equal to minus a rate constant. Great, this is really easy. Except in reality, the actual reaction we're looking at looks like this. So I will just give you a second to digest what's going on here. There's a lot going on. Um, for instance, what we're actually looking for, everything is in equilibrium. Um, and there are forward and backward reactions everywhere. There are two isomers that this can form. Uh, one of these isomers can actually eliminate, not directly, but by undergoing something called um, migratory insertion. So that ligand goes into there, and then it eliminates the pentaldehyde. Uh, so there are two pathways that this could actually go back to the starting material. So things get a little bit uh, complex, and we need to take into account all of this at all uh, at different times. Now we could do some simplifications. We can assume the equilibria um, don't play too much of a part. We can assume that some rate constants are slow and so on. But this is the kind of thing you need to take into account when we're taking with dealing with complex reactions. So this is really the highest level of how complicated things can get. I mean, there's a little bit more complicated uh, ones out there, but this is probably the most realistic, uh, most complicated example. Anyway, we're going to start with the simplest thing. That is the irreversible reaction. This is the very model of first order kinetics. We've got concentration inside, and we can just call this molar proportion percent. Makes it really easy. Along the bottom, T, and we realize that the products, they go down. The reactants and this is why you don't just do things on autopilot the products go up the reactants go down there we go it's that way around um, and what you'll notice is by the end there's 100% product 0% reactant. So this is the kind of thing where maybe this is a gas and it escapes so there's no way it could come back uh, and reform the starting material. It goes entirely in one direction or maybe the equilibrium constant is in the millions or billions uh, and the energy difference is huge. So this is very simple and we can model that really really straightforward. Um, the rate, we define the rate as negative of the reactants positive of the gradient of the products, and that is equal to K times V. First order kinetics, all that rate depends on is the concentration of this, nothing else. So the next layer of complexity to add is equilibria. So we covered this basically in the thermodynamics section because equilibria are based around some thermodynamic parameters and equilibria can tell us a little bit about this. So let's look at this exact same graph again. Uh, you start with 100%, 0% here for our concentrations, and the products come up, but only to about what? That might be about 70%, and therefore this is 30%. Okay, so so clearly there is something else going on here there must be some kind of backwards reaction some of this is going backwards in this direction it's reforming the starting material and that will then go to well not necessarily completion only to this 70 percent so there is a you know there's still some of the reactant left so there's a little bit of complexity added there uh so here we find what is the rate we need to figure out what actually changes the concentration of A and B here? Okay, so we can find, for instance, uh, let's think about what changes the concentration of B. There are two reactions that are going to do that. One, it's formed from A. It goes forward, and that's a first-order reaction. What's the rate of change of that? It's equal to K1 times A. It's a first-order reaction. And then we've got a backwards reaction, uh, and that's also a first-order reaction. It's K minus 1 times the concentration of that. So B changes according to these two uh, and it appears or disappears. The concentration increases at that rate, it decreases at this rate. And so what we get is this kind of thing. Uh, we add them together. 
Now, in this case, these two equations I've got on screen uh, are exactly the same. I've just reversed the positive and negative of them. Uh, so this is just to underscore the fact that both are perfectly valid, but you need to be aware, what would you define the rate as? So would you define the rate of reaction as negative and then positive of the products? We get this one. Uh, but if we're actually just straight after the gradient of the reactants, for instance, it's the other way around. So that should be hopefully easy to follow. Uh, but don't get bogged down if you see negatives or positives reversed at some point. Um, it all depends on how you want to define your rate in the first place. Um, again, if you get something like uh, A going to 2B or something like this, you might find factors of 2 make their way in, in different places. Same kind of thing. They're all equally valid. Just be careful about how you define it in the first place. All right, so what kind of assumption can we make to make the equilibrium really uh, easy? Uh, we can assume that it is at equilibrium. Ah. So at equilibrium, there is no change in their concentration. They are equal, they have stabilized. So our rate of change is equal to these two things added together. And finally, we can stick a number on it. We can say it's equal to zero. So this is a kind of a recurring theme in the multi-step reactions and equilibrium and so on. Set it to zero. So we're saying there is no change in these concentrations at all. So that means, by extension, the forward and backward reactions are happening at the same speed. Uh, K1 times A, that forward reaction, and K minus 1 times B, that backwards reaction, happen at the same speed. Uh, speed. So we can start manipulating these symbols around and get us some new information. Uh, and that's what we get down there. So we could take B over to the other side and then K1 to the other side uh, and we get that equation down there. The storm is really picking up outside. Uh, we get this. Uh, so what information does that tell us? Well, it's two concentrations over the top of each other, that is equal to big K, that equilibrium constant. Uh, so that's how we start getting thermodynamic parameters from kinetics and relating kinetics to thermodynamics. So let's just kind of review this. We're looking at rates of reaction, rates is proportional to concentration, i.e. this, that's what we should know. Uh, in equilibrium though, there are forward and backwards reactions. So the reaction disappears at one particular rate and it reforms at another rate backwards reaction. So at equilibrium, our rate is zero. Uh, so well, our overall rate of change, we have to add the two things together. All of the processes that form something, we add, and we add all the processes that remove it as well. So those are two things just added together. The overall rate is zero. Um, at equilibrium, we can start manipulating numbers and rearranging them. So let's go on to two-step reactions. So this is the next step up from just equilibrium. Uh, it's only a little step, in fact, because uh, we're only looking at two rate constants again. This time we'll call them K1 and K2. Uh, just to recap the name scheme thing, we can, in fact, call that KAB to prove that it goes from A to B, or KBC, and that shows that it goes from B to C. Um, they're just naming schemes. You can use anything you like. Uh, we are dealing with three chemicals here, um, but two, re two reactions, so it's not going to be too much more complicated than the equilibrium case. So our rate, we want to define it just in terms of the initial um, product, uh, initial reactants, and by the final product. That's all. So we're only interested in that as far as the rate of reaction is concerned. We don't really care about these intermediates. But we do care about the rate of change of everything in between. So dA by dt. How does A change? Well, there's only one reaction that alters the concentration of this, uh, and that is a first order reaction where A goes to B. So that must go at minus K1. A, our reactant, will decrease at a particular first order rate. Uh, next, let's go to what does C do? Well, that is produced only by one reaction, and that is a first order reaction. 
that depends on the concentration of B. Uh, so it's kind of the opposite. Imagine if we just went from A to C, not via B at all. These would be what we got, what we'd get out of that. Uh, dB by dt, this is slightly more complicated though, because we have two reactions that change the concentration of B. Uh, one, it grows by a first order reaction. And what is that first order reaction? Well, it depends entirely on the concentration of A. So that's K1. A. Great, that's a, pretty much the opposite of this. So this is what we'd expect if that was just a single step reaction that was irreversible. Uh, but B is removed by another reaction. K2 multiplied by the concentration of B. So we've got this reaction that increases the concentration, that reaction then decreases it. So this is the final result of what we're looking for. Uh, Two reactions change the concentration of B, so that's a little bit more of a complicated formula. Uh, now, the thing we want to assume is something called the steady state approximation. And that's to say that the rate of change of B is zero. Okay, again, just like the equilibrium case, we are setting something to zero. Really useful for us because that allows us to start moving things around. So if that is equal to zero, well, these two rates must be the same. So that tells us that we can rearrange these formula if dc by dt is equal to this rate constant. Well, we can actually just substitute that in for this. There we go. So if the rate of b doesn't change, or, the, or its concentration doesn't change, its rate of change is zero, uh, then here we have, that's an analytical solution. Uh, the changing concentration of our final product is only equal to one rate constant and A. Uh, now there are a couple of caveats as to why that works. This has to be really slow and this one has to be really fast. So kind of visualize this in your head. A goes to B really slowly and then B almost instantly reacts to form C. Well. B hardly has any time to accumulate. It doesn't change. It's just hanging around there very, very briefly. So this makes some sense. Um, if it was the other way around, you could kind of imagine what's going to happen. Imagine this happened really quickly. A just disappears to form B, but this one is a really slow reaction. Well, in which case, our B appears really quickly. Our rate of C's formation will probably only be K2B. And by the time the steady state approximation kicks in, this is the only rate we're interested in. So there's a few things going on. Remember, there is not always one size fits all. So what you need to be able to do is happily manipulate these numbers and then predict what happens if one rate constant is a lot higher than the other. Uh, or what happens if they're equal, that kind of thing. So let's just review the two step reactions because we're cracking on quite nicely here. We need to define the rate first. That's always our first step in kinetics, defining the rate. Uh, and we just ignore the intermediates here. The concentrations, it's not worth bothering about when we just want to define a rate because our rate of reaction is defined uh, as really just the products or react, initial reactants changing. Uh, but we are interested in what is the rate of change of um, that intermediate uh, because it tells us a little something about the other rate constants. So B increases at a rate of K1A, B decreases at the rate of K2 times B, uh, and those are added together. Just kind of like in the equilibrium case, we are adding things together. And then finally, we can simplify things using the steady state approximation. So we assume there's no change in B. So that is always going to be equal to zero. Therefore, we can say that those are the same. And then we get, we start rearranging things uh, we can insert wherever we see K1 multiplied by A, we could insert that or vice versa. Again, this is really all about the, your skill in manipulating the equations. So it is a bit of algebra and mathematics, um, but it is something you need to practice. So this topic really is uh, skills based. It is not something that you can just learn. You really just need to be able to manipulate equations. Uh, and they're not always immediately straightforward or obvious, but you can probably get 99% of that way with just a few tricks. Uh, so now we're going to do multi-step.
So I've only I've gone up in complexity again and basically combined equilibria and two-step reactions here. Uh, so this we're now looking at three reactions. We are looking at a forward one that's labelled as K1, a backwards one labelled K minus one, and a second reaction. So A and B are in equilibrium. Uh, maybe they're two isomers, but only one isomer reacts. So this is um, kind of similar to that um, rhodium example I showed you at the beginning. Two of them are in e might be in equilibrium, but only one actually reacts. So we have to take into account this. So again, our rate is defined as only what the starting material and the end product is. That's fine. So let's start with the easiest form. What's the rate of change of C? So this is really, really easy. There's only one reaction changes the concentration of C. That is positive because it increases K2B. Really easy. That is the easiest reaction there. So if you're building up a reaction scheme, look at the easiest ones. What's the, uh, what's the material that only changes according to one reaction? Start with that one, then write it down. We now know this is a first order reaction that's um, true. Right, so let's start with the second easiest one. Our initial reactants. So that's the second easiest one because there's only two reactions that change its concentration. One that decreases it, that's the first order reaction that it eliminates, and one that, oops, sorry, I'll draw that arrow the right way around, one that puts it back. So K minus 1B, that's going to increase the concentration. K1A, that's going to decrease the concentration. So that's our second easiest example. Finally, the intermediate. This one is probably the more difficult one because there's now three reactions that change its concentration. One that lowers it, another one that lowers it, and one that increases it. So B can disappear at a particular rate, but it goes in two directions. It can either go over to C or it can go back to A. And B can only be increased by this one reaction here. So while it's a little bit more complicated, the same principle applies exactly. We are adding all the processes that it can be reformed with and then subtracting the processes that remove it. Uh, and if we apply the steady state approximation, we can set that all to zero. That allows us to start doing again some manipulation of the numbers to make a few other predictions. Can we get rid of the intermediate uh, when it comes to the formation of our product, for instance? So we know dc by dt is equal to uh, plus k2b. Uh, can we get rid of this b by using this approximation? So yeah, we can kind of deal with that. Uh, so we start with our basic um, rate law that we've set to zero because we're going to assume that this doesn't change. Uh, and then rearrange it. So we bring this to one side and then I'll flip the signs so we have k1 must be equal to this uh, and k1a we can bring b out as a common factor here and then just simply do a little bit of rearranging so we bring that to that side and there we have it k1 over k minus 1 plus k2 times the concentration of a is what the concentration of b is great so that's really useful so now if we can say that dc by dt is equal to k2b. We've got a formula for what b is, uh, based only on one other thing. We can combine that in together. So now our rate of change is a ratio between different rate constants in the reaction, which is still just a constant, uh, and a. Uh, now, at some point, you might recognize um, a little bit of a overlap with what might be called the pseudo first order approximation that is kind of the equivalent of k observed if we were to plot this the rate is equal to that so it means if we plotted say uh, log a over time we would get a straight line out uh, and that gradient would be equal to k pops um, that observed rate constant. Now that is not necessarily saying it is a first order reaction exactly. Um, that k obs would be equal to 
all of those rate constants put together. So there is a limited amount of data that we can actually begin to extract out of this reaction. Um, but the numbers might break down a little bit differently. So let's just kind of review that now. Um, it's been quite a long and arduous screencast, I think. Uh, we are looking at multiple rates of change. So for instance, the equilibria means we can do forward and backwards reactions. Um, so what thing? Label the rate constants. Okay, I'm dealing principally with K1, K minus 1 for a backwards reaction and so on, but you can still do KAB, KBA, KBC, that kind of thing. Just maybe experiment with that. If that makes if that makes more sense to you, use that. Uh, and we can use the steady state approximation. So if we're talking about two-step and multi-step, this is the one we're interested in. The intermediates don't change. Uh, now, if we assume that, it means we can ignore them um, because look at how those equations were all being manipulated together. Uh, we're finding that if that intermediate here is equal to, uh, the change of the intermediate is equal to zero, um, we can start plugging different values in. Uh, and it turns out we don't need to know that concentration. So most of the time, as far as you're concerned, that's what you're trying to do. We're trying to get an analytical solution to what's the rate of the, uh, of the reaction and the way we approach that is by assuming certain rates don't change. Kind of gives us a little chink into the equations that lets us uh, rearrange them. Right. So, complex reactions. We are looking for analytical solutions to predict a rate of formation uh, and our main approximations are the equilibrium one and steady state. So we can approach those in different ways. Then we want to do ma mathematical manipulations uh, in order to get things. Uh, this is, of course, really important. There is not one thing you have to memorize as a procedure here. Yes, if you want to get a rate constant, yes, plot, log, over t, get a gradient. Um, that's a procedure. Dealing with complex reactions is a skill. It is manipulating equations. You might find yourself going down on a completely wrong track. You might not be able to figure out how things cancel. Um, yeah, you're building analytical solutions here. They are a little bit tricky to deal with. Um, so unfortunately, that is just how it works. Um, there is no one way of memorizing. Uh, there are a couple of tricks equilibria, steady state, and so on. But you just have to learn some maths and some algebra to manipulate things, and that's it. Uh, so that's kind of it for complex reactions. That's all you really need to know. The rest is just practice. Uh, what I want to go on to now is modeling. Uh, so this is a little bit of an extension. If you're struggling to kind of get into your head how we would do this in reality, this might still be useful for you. Uh, if you're finding the complex reactions kind of easy, uh, this will be a nice extension. If you're finding complex reactions really hard, to a degree this is actually simpler, um, then we're going to do a numerical solution. So I introduced that concept at the beginning that we have analytical solutions and numerical solutions. This is the numerical side. Um, so what we can kind of see is this is kind of a real-ish reaction that's two-step. Uh, and what were we assuming before? We were assuming that db by dt equals zero. Uh, now, if you look at this graph, that's clearly not the case at all. Uh, this is zero, well, there and here. Oh, okay, so, so that is roughly to zero and very, for what, only a couple of seconds in the action. Uh, and by the time it approximates to zero, the reaction's pretty much done. So that assumption, uh, Half the time is actually quite useless to us. It's not really brilliant. Um, but there are too many variables in here to make an exact analytical solution. So we're going to model it step by step. Uh, so where do we start with this? Um, one thing is to start with kind of the integrated rate law, because this gives us a little bit of a hint of how we're going to do this. So you should be used to at least integrating a rate law like this. You go from time zero to time t. 
that's how we deal with an analytical solution. We're only interested in the initial conditions and then we can plug any value of time into it to get a concentration out. So we solve that. Uh, but there is a more generic way of doing this. Zero and T aren't the only kind of limits that we can stick into this integration. We can actually stick in these. This is T and T plus delta T. Um, in fact, this is the more generic version. Uh, this is, that's T and that is, well, T plus delta T, but the delta T is much bigger and T is zero. Okay, so this one at the bottom here is the much more generic solution. Uh, so it tells us we can actually kind of integrate it just in tiny little steps. We can see what's the rate of change over maybe a second and then the next second, then a second after that. Or maybe we can do it even in smaller discrete chunks, a tenth of a second, a hundredth of a second, or so on. So this is kind of the starting point of how we want to figure this out. We want to break it, the reaction down into chunks of time because we're doing a numerical solution. So this is going to be a model or a simulation. What happens from one second to the next? So that is sort of the starting hint of how we're going to do this. Uh, so if we integrate this, we can find the concentration of A based on whatever it was at the beginning. Here we find what's the concentration in a second's time based on what it was well, now, or what is the concentration now based on a second ago. You know, either way it's the same. These values are entirely arbitrary. This is just the most generic version of the one you're used to seeing. Right, so now let's start with what these rate laws are. So we covered these rate laws. Uh, now what happens to these equations if suddenly we start integrating in small chunks of time? Uh, well, these actually become meaningful. Um, we can change this dt to literally one second. So this rate of change tells us how far does this change in one second? Okay, so maybe at time, well, maybe 17 seconds into a reaction, this is at 75% concentration, then 18 seconds, it's at 68% concentration and so on. That is literally a step change of reaction. We've got delta T there and then changing concentration. So we can actually stick actual values in there. So this is going to be an approximation, sure. And I'll get onto the consequence of using the approximation in a moment. Um, but they are physically meaningful values. So if that means this is an actual change in value over a particular set of time, uh, it gets us something like this. Here's the concentration we started at. Add that change in concentration, and that gets us what it's going to be. So maybe 10 seconds into the reaction, there's 0.5 moles. 11 seconds into the reaction, there's 0.6 moles. Then dA by d, well, let's just do it one second, is equal to 0.1 moles. So you can actually stick actual numbers into this and work it out. Now, because of this first order equation, we can actually substitute that speed for something a bit more precise here. So actually, look at this. This actually becomes really, really simple. It, the concentration at any particular time is equal to the concentration that it was before minus the rate law. Wow, that's really easy. That's a very linear, basic equation. It's a little bit complex to get there, uh, but it's a really easy equation. Now, that means we can actually apply it. Uh, so let's just assume that this is 100. So I'm not going to stick units on this. I just want a nice round number um, to illustrate this. This is a schematic. So our rate of change is equal to K1 times A. And our K1, I'm going to put it is 0.1 per second. So I'm now going to multiply that by the time. Uh, we're going to advance this forward by one second. Okay, so that's really just kind of... Uh, our change is going to be that times one. Okay, so we're going to just ignore that for now. Um, so what is 0 0.1 times the concentration? Uh, well, 10. So a tenth of this is going to react. So we actually want 100 minus 10, and that's 90. And then that will move to B. Okay, so there we go. 
we've done something like this. So these are the numbers. Uh, so this we've literally changed to uh, uh, 90 and then we move to 10 here. Okay, so what's the change in the concentration of B? We've now got this to change. Well, we've got a, uh, a rate that increases its concentration and a rate that decreases it. Uh, previously, we couldn't change this because its concentration was zero. That was equal to zero. So it meant nothing. Uh, but now, K2 is here. So we're going to add, uh, what, 0 0.1 times 90. We're going to add that, and we're going to subtract that 0 0.05 times 10. So I'm just going to fill that in as necessary. So I've pre-done this. Remember, we've jumped. This is going down by 10% each time. Uh, and adding to here, and then this number is at the same time going down um, as it transfers to C. Okay, so we are doing this step by step, calculating it out by treating this changing concentration as an actual number. Now, here's the caveat to this. So you, you could type these equations into a spreadsheet, no problem, and do it, or you can sit and do it by hand. Uh, certainly easier in a spreadsheet because then you can drag down and do hundreds of data points at once. Um, here's some minor caveats to it. Uh, notice here I've taken my delta t as one second. It's fine enough. Uh, but here's delta t at five seconds. Okay, so I'm actually, I've gone ahead and done this in 20 separate steps and my concentration predicted to be 12.16. Here I've taken delta t as chunks of five seconds and it goes to 100. 50, 25, 12.5, 6.2. Okay, that's a huge disagreement. So when I say that numerical solutions are an approximation, this is why. Um, you are actually deviating a little bit from the exact analytical solution each time. Uh, this is much more widely applicable, certainly, and you can minimize the effect of this, certainly, um, but it is going to be there if you try this method. Uh, so it's deviating quite a bit from this. In fact, let's change this again. What you might see is that we've got one second, half a second. If we do a step change, so this requires twice as many steps now, we're subtracting this time as one second and subtracting that time as 0.5 seconds. Uh, we get, oh, it's a slightly different number. Okay, the agreement is a little similar. At least it begins with a 12, but it is very different. Uh, now the reason for that is because the analytical solution, that first order rate, integrated rate law, um, treats delta t as if it was zero. That's what we do when we integrate things. We are treating this kind of steps, uh, the steps as kind of infinitesimal in size. So it's a little bit mathematically, uh, if that's even a word. And you can see there's a little difference. We go to 13. Actually go, sorry, go forward. So what we can see is there's actually a progress here, um, the progression here. At five seconds uh, intervals, we estimate that it's 6.25. If we simulate it one second intervals, 12.16. If we estimate it at half a second interval, that's 12.85. Uh, and if we assume that zero seconds, this is our analytical solution. It's 13.5, but actually it kind of gradually increases to this number. Uh, so the shorter that delta t is in our simulation, the closer to the real value we get. Uh, so um, if you, there is an additional maths video I did on about E and exponential solutions. Uh, you should be able to spot kind of a uh, similarity here. That exponential um, equation, the one with E in it, um, is where the limit of the step change goes towards zero. So that whole progression is useful. So anyway, let's just assume that this is a meaningful quantity and we're going to pick a time scale. One second. So if our reaction lasts an hour, one second is pretty good. That gives us maybe a couple hundred data points to simulate. Then we build the model uh, and then everything changes by d by dt. So we take time times that rate of change times dt and we substitute it in for the rate law. So we can see that it will change by this or that. And for really complicated reactions, we can just make that as big as we like. 
you know, K3A minus K4AB or something like that, you know, these things could get really complicated. Uh, all we're doing is bolting on more rate laws. So that's kind of where it's simple. We're just bolting on the rate laws, really. Um, so that could be as huge as we like. Um, and we go through and simulate it. And we can get the rate constants just by manipulating numbers in our simulation and getting it to match data. Okay, so that's probably another video's worth of material. Uh, but this is modeling. It's one way of approaching it as a numerical solution. Uh, but as I said earlier, what we're really interested in in this topic, or what you're expected to do in an exam, is still just the analytical solutions from here.